Welcome back to Talos of Rivian Park. Oh, sorry, EV Podcast. Wrong I did not like all that shunning that Drew was being very pessimistic about Rivian, so I got rid of him. And in blue of a guy who believed in Compass Yellow and the newest stand member of Rivian right here today. How you doing, Mike? Why does it sound like you're on a stage or something like that? Because, because I am talking, talking to the, the thousands, thousands of loyal followers out there, out there who believe in the, the R2 and R3, R3 coming, coming to, fruition to fruition and not, and not running, running out, out of cash, cash or any of that any other, other things. things. I will take, I will the, take stage the stage one, one more time. time. My, my fellow, fellow Rivianites. Rivianites this is this our, our time. time. We, we shall, shall prevail. prevail. Okay. 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 I have to. I have, Why do I just get? I get a visual of uh, Hux, General Hux from the Star Wars sequels, where he's making <laughs> Mar, <laughs> Mar, and then I'm trying to teach my son sign language. Mar. <laughs> no, I think um, that's Kylo Ren. I was thinking redhead guy that we don't yeah. have here today but the other redhead guy i don't think he said oh Mar, yeah that was kylo who did that he was like Mar! as he's shooting at luke <laughs> yeah. i love it when kylo ren starts signing more to Mar! <laughs> uh the first order people plot holes to... Mar! <laughs> i have That's a very weird. quick confession for you mike not that i would ever change teams for this but oh I think I really like Compass Yellow. Knew it. it. That is the correct choice. And especially with my track record with saying the Model Y is the best vehicle. You are Stop. now just validating my opinion even more with Compass Yellow. It's fun. Being Each the best time car. this happens, it's when Drew's not here. And I swear it's not because I like, oh, Drew's not here. I gotta, I gotta tell you something. It's that I was looking over some stuff on. Anyway, I, long story short, I'm just Rivian deep diving things. And the longer I was looking at it, it's like, this is such a unique off yellow that I don't hate you anymore. And then it, it evolved into like, I actually like this color because you would see it and you would, you would already know that's a Rivian. Because yellow is not a popular or very known color, especially mm -hmm. one like that. The only thing that's yellow that I know is the truly Nolan, you know, pest control yellow on the little rat. <laughs> Volkswagen's driving around. My dad used to work for. Yeah, he used to work for them. So I, my dad, he had a truck with rabbit or not rabbit, but mice ears and stuff. I was like, this is mm -hmm. weird. But I usually associate yellow with Chevy because they've got the Camaro and the Silverado and their logo were and their logo that were marketed with yellow for a lot of the. Uh, was it late two? I guess yeah, late two thousands, early no. Early 2010s. Yeah, around that time. Um, funnily enough, today, of all days, there is a yellow R1T uh, in the oncoming, I guess, going, let's just say, it's going northbound. And okay. I'm heading southbound. And I thought, oh, cool. A compass yellow R1T. And then not two minutes later, I look in my rearview mirror. There's another yellow R1T. <laughs> and I oh. thought... Is this the same truck? No, it can't be because they would have to, in that time, jump over the guardrail and then catch up. I think that's like the only possible way without having to miraculously take an exit ramp, go over the overpass, and then come back on an on ramp. Yeah. And you wouldn't be able to in that amount of time. But yeah, Compass Yellow, you, you are definitely right, sir, is the best color. I did not say that. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. No, I'm still I'm a... still green, forest green, or was the founder of green? I I'm still team green. <laughs> Boom, Shh. Apple Watch. Okay, it's looking quite faded with all that leather, but anyway, green is still the correct color. But much like when we were breaking down, I think it was the Volvo, and I was looking at the colors, and I was like, I didn't hate that. Like I realized that like I like colors that are not popular. Mm -hmm. And maybe my subconscious is telling me that green is getting more popular. You, you texted a photo in our group chat earlier this week about another Randy Green Model 3 out there. And I'm just like, ah, I'm not special. But you know what is special? Compass yellow. Maybe I just like going against the grain. I like colors that, don't, that aren't your typical 
default color for people. Everybody wants black or white, red or blue. Like those are your standard vehicle colors. And also colors in 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 like just everyday life. But yellow, like that that's a that's a statement. <laughs> mm-hmm. And but it's Rivian's logo and I, I've I found myself to have quite an affinity for it. Uh I, I like I'm becoming the biggest Rivian stand, I like even more so than I was thinking. I the more I research, the more uh next week these lights, if they're still here, one of them's gonna be compass yellow. I'm gonna pull the actual color code and program it to that one right there. Yeah, the one on your left is getting close to compass yellow. I got it Speaking wrong. Speaking of I I guess Rivian, since we're on the topic of Rivian. Uh, before I jump into some other news. Sure. Uh, the Power Tano is apparently back with Rivian. I saw. It only took them, I think, what, like a year and a half? Forever. To come back with it? It seemed like forever. Yeah. And uh, it's exciting that it's back. I'm very happy that the Power Tano's back. Hopefully they fixed everything that was wrong with it. I think the next order of business now is get the camp kitchen going in the uh, gear tunnel and I guess on the back of the R1S. Yeah. Gear kitchen. Gear For real, kitchen. I, I just want to... I just... I just want to see what you guys have seen already. That's all. I'm, I'm in the position I feel like either you or Drew, or even if... Let's go back even further. Nick, like, you guys didn't see Cybertruck. I did, and you guys still had this, like... Like, oh, man. Like, there, was, there was all that attraction towards it. To which then after I saw it in person at, at the Peterson Museum, I was like, man, this is like, there's just, it just solidified things for me. But now that I had seen it and touched it, it was already real. But for everyone else, it's like, oh man, that like, there's, there's like lore behind it because you haven't really seen it yet. That's me with any Rivian vehicle. I have not been able to like be in silent. I've talked to owners. I've seen it in passing uh, and I, it just gets me more and more like hyped up to the point that even my wife is like, your next vehicle is going to be a Rivian, isn't it? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. You like Krabby Patty Squidward, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> oh, I remember my first Krabby Patty. That, that's me with the EVs, right? And, and she, because I think she's like noticing that like you haven't been this excited since Model 3. And I was like, well. What can you say? I want to address my thing with Rivian before we move on to... We won't make it another Rivian episode, all right, guys? I, I We won't do that, but... Um, it goes on for another 30 minutes. I'll try not to, but you know I me. I'll, I'll find a way to drag it out. I have thoughts about this criticism I keep seeing about Rivian... Uh, going to be out of cash before the launch of the R2. And even people making YouTube videos about it, breaking down, going as far as like, I'm selling my stocks, all my stocks, like they, there's no path forward and all this and the other. And I, my first reaction is, well, okay, the first thing I would say is that before I bought Tesla stock and before I bought the Model 3, I did all my homework, years and years of worth of, of what Tesla was about before I did what I did. And that was in 2016, okay? So I was not a genius for buying in before it got big. I would have never thought it would have been a Fortune 500 company, one of the most valuable companies at one point. I did not think that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a financial wizard. I am not a guru, and I do not have financial advice. I just put my money where my mouth is personally, and I, I bought what I liked, what I believed in. That was it. With that being said, I told myself after the, after the big Tesla like blow up and it got as big as it did and it's got as valuable as it did, I, I told myself I, I would not try to capture lightning twice and that f- furthermore, um, I would exit the space of EVs as a whole and uh, just let the market do what it's got to do and I'll just, you know, vibe towards what i like again towards something because i did the same thing for apple but apple is more mainstream so and i and i'm older than more people most people will listen to the show so i i i bought apple stock before even that like all these things i'm not i'm not smart i'm not lucky i'm just right or maybe it is just i'm I, that's what it is i'm lucky i'm just right time right place for things 
with that saying all of that, it was that for me, I am not a Rivian stockholder. And it's not that I don't want to be. It's that I made a promise to myself well before I became a next fanboy for something that I just wasn't going to risk all that. I'm I'm a father now. You know, I got more to lose than I did when it was just me. I when I did all that thing with Tesla, I wasn't even a married man, so it was really just me. It was just do or die for me. Oh well, if I lost this money, I'll, I'll make it back. Now it's like I have a house, I have a wife, I have a kid, I have a family. I'm not doing that. So that's my preface to say all this. Everyone who says that Rivian is 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 going to be out of business before R2 because just simple math, that, you know, it's not mathing. My initial reaction to doing mediocre research is that it's not that simple. It's not that black and white. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. I'm also not putting my money where my mouth is this time. I'm not buying the stock, but that doesn't mean I think they're, they're the next Nikola or Fordstown or, you know, Lordstown. I said Fordstown. (laughs) <laughs> Fordstown, <laughs> Lordstown, the next whatever. I'm not saying any of those things. What I am saying is that for so, what I've noticed in any part of the, the free market of America, which Rivian is an American company, fandom has a very interesting way of keeping things alive, even with on paper they shouldn't be. And, and no, no better place to point towards than that of like other evs that may or may not make it but are definitely staying around a lot longer than i would have thought they would have um i th- it's not as simple as like they're burning through cash and then that's that it's just not it, it, it if we were going by that logic maybe this is where my my like no Tesla has very, very little debt. And they have a lot of money. And yet the stock still drops. That same scenario, the stock should never go down. They have very little debt. Apple, the most valuable company in the world. The stock still drops. Now, when we zo- depending on how far back you want to zoom, it's still a trajectory, it still shoots up. But when we're going like, oh, is it going to make it to, you know, they got only eight quarters left until they're. It is not the same to compare one apples to apples. Eh, That was a cheap joke, but it's not the same to just compare those things, because by the same law, like when you're talking about stock prices, when you're talking about the valuation of a company and and the only thing that we can tangibly look at is a stock if it's if it's publicly listed. The only thing uh, that I know about the market is that it's not logic-based. It's emotionally driven. It's all emotionally driven. Because like I said, companies with very little debt, stocks should never go down. That just wouldn't make sense. But yet, it does. Doesn't make sense. So to say the same thing on the, on the adverse, and Rivian is not the only one that I feel this way. There's other companies that it's like on paper, it doesn't look like they should be surviving, and they are. Even if they're not even publicly traded, knowing what I know, they shouldn't be surviving and yet they do like at the end of the day we could say the same thing about youtube youtube was not profitable for blah 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 blah. google should just sell it cut their loss but youtube won't die they're not going to get rid of youtube there's something about the fandom of 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 just i don't know if it's like a a, a status symbol or or like a, a this lore about it but Things have a way of sticking around a lot longer, even if you think they should be gone. And and the other way around too. Things have a, things look, apparently can drop and dip and die when you feel like that doesn't make sense. Why would that happen? When we talk about you know on the on life support, you talk about Canoe and you talk about all these other companies and you think the same thing. Like wow, that took a wrong turn. <sighs> so all the haters saying Rivian ain't ain't. Ain't gonna make it to R2 or all the doubters. It's easy to, you know, backseat drive. It's easy to sideline coach things, but you don't have all the information still. And neither do I, but I do know that 
it's never that simple and and I, I, I feel like if there was a case where Rivian's going to be out of money, somebody or some entity, some organization, some something, if Lucid could get Saudi funds to help them stay af afloat, like somebody's going to come in and, and help Rivian. I don't know who, I don't know what, I don't know when, but if that was the end scenario, I don't think it, I, it's too fanatic the fan base and i say this as a newly indoctrinated fanatic if newly if, if, yeah i think you're pretty indoctrinated at this point randy it's been a year or so yeah but now it's like there, there's there's something about it I, that i'm believing and i don't know what it is maybe it's intuition maybe it's just maybe the fact that it's just not tesla and somebody else is surviving and maybe i like an underdog story but mm -hmm. there's something about it man and it, it it can't be that simple. I just don't see it. Even T-Mobile, when they were, or not T-Mobile, even Sprint, when they were going out of business and getting bought up by T-Mobile, before it happened, it was business as usual, and they found a way to technically, on paper, the, every customer who was a Sprint customer eventually became a T-Mobile customer, but your service didn't turn off. Something happened. They got mm -hmm. bought out. They got saved. I, something, something will happen to Rivian on the worst case scenario that they're out of money does not, I don't see that being that that's the end. That's the end of their story. I, and I don't know why I just call it a feeling. Sure. The only difference is this time I'm not betting on it uh, with, with stock money. I, I don't, I'm not interested in doing that anymore, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't make me any less of a believer in, in, in Rivian's uh, success. Sure. That, that's it. Yeah, I think, like you said, it's not as simple as it seems. It's a very vast web of complexity that you cannot really track all the variables and how they interact with each other. It's pretty much... I've got a buddy in the, uh, the chemistry space. He's getting his PhD right now. And just like, whether you're gene editing or even just changing the... Uh, the water uh, chemical makeup, or at least what's in, in the water with the fish that he's experimenting on. Uh, you, you can't just say it's a corollary A is e or A leads to B. It's very much, there's a lot of things that add to A in that process for it to get to B, or a lot of things that can even uh, detour it where A doesn't even equal B. It goes to f <laughs> or something like that uh there's so many different variables at play that it's having a nice summarized explanation is great but you can't just use that as the backbone for everything right. there has to be a lot more factors that impact a situation it's not just as as simple as I punched it, so it moved. <laughs> or they don't have money, or they keep on losing money, so they're going to go away. Uh, if we followed that, Lucid would technically be gone. Fisker would be gone. Lordstown would be gone, but they're still somehow kicking under a new name. Nicola somehow would be survived. gone. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole lot of these companies that even... Going back to what you said last year and the year before, there's so many startups. Some of them have to go eventually. They all can't survive, but they go. They don't go down without a fight. Typically, is what yeah. I'm noticing in a lot of these. Whether it's the billionaire CEO backing it that refuses to quit and just tries to get investing under a new name. I mean, heck, that's kind of what Aptera did, but under the same name. And with the same CEOs, eventually, uh, after all that drama going on there. But they're back, and they're more promising than ever. I would think, kind of like with what we said also in the past, if, if Rivian were to go under, Amazon's poured a whole lot of money into them. And I'm sure Amazon wants to keep on having electric delivery vans. And of course, they could lean on Ford, Mercedes, and Ram with the e-transit the e-sprinter and the promaster electric or 
for Master EV either or. Uh, yeah. They could do that, but I think they're pretty happy with their EDVs. And uh, even going into that segment, the EDV is now being used by many different customers. It's not just Amazon using it now. You've got DHL, a most recent adopter of the EDV platform for their delivery trucks. And uh, I haven't kept track of the rest. (laughs) But seeing a picture online of a big yellow... Another yellow company that I respect. Yeah, kind of. I'd have to do more research on them. But a big yellow van with a red stripe on it's hard to ignore on your timeline. So I I would say, yeah, it's not as easy and simple as it is. Also, I think I would have somewhat of the same... Maybe not the same. I would have a lot more concern if they weren't adapting the Nax port. But the fact that this development has occurred in the last year where a lot of companies have adopted the Nax port, it makes the existence of EVs that much more certain. Yeah. Where we're not having to have a whole Tesla with a whole bunch of 50,000 plus superchargers everywhere versus Electrify America, which is not reliable. But now, starting Sorry, this Volkswagen. week... Yeah, right. Yeah. Starting the well no, they're on the next train. Uh I think oh goodness. I'd have to look at it again. That's I think Infinity awkward. Infinity <laughs> still hasn't adopted it technically. I don't think uh Nissan included them in their statement. But. Isn't Volkswagen one of the main funders or owners of the of uh of EA? Uh isn't isn't the, they're the main yeah. backer? It was born so. from it. <laughs> the fact that like even now they're on the track of uh you know adopting Nax, it's like well ugh. awkward right yeah so uh, with uh starting this week rivians can now supercharge yeah with oh, an yeah, adapter that's that, nice congratulations rivians yeah that's coming out i think the adapter's going to be either on sale and or given out uh next month in april that just means it's much more certain for those that want to adventure with their trucks, whether it's in the city or out in the middle of nowhere. They have an option to charge wherever they can, and they don't have to worry about it as much anymore. And right. which makes the adoption of the product that much more appealing. And especially coming into the years after that, uh, succeeding that, where the next port is... Uh, in the vehicle now instead of having to carry around an adapter it's already installed there it just means that you don't have to carry around an adapter anymore and which maybe the common consumer won't really care as much but it makes using that vehicle that much more i didn't care that i had an adapter for uh for my tesla you know back in 20 type one yeah yeah i i I ha- I still or, have it in my sorry, in my glove compartment. Sorry, the J seventy two, but yeah, yeah. Like J7 I mean, J7 adapters are. It is what it is. And another thing, another thing, real quick though. I don't think there's an Osborne effect happening for Rivian because now R two and R three have been announced that nobody's going to buy an R one. There are still, they still have, there's no new trucks in the in the pipeline here to be to be released. Our R one S is still a the biggest of the SUV lineup. So. It still has a use case if you need another row of seat, like all that. To me, nothing's changed. And the people who want to buy something with the bigger cabin space and and or a bed, R2 announcement and then waiting changes nothing. It just doesn't change anything. So I disagree with with there being an Osborne effect about like, oh, well, now people are just going to wait. And so now Rivian's really not going to sell anything because now people are going to wait for R2. Not, no, I, I don't see. No, that's one more thing I disagree with. That's not. That's not a thing. I don't see that happening. I, I would see that there is some influence there. Uh, if R two and R three were not mentioned in the past few years by R J and the Rivian team, it would have been a lot more. There would be a lot more questions on: Are you making an R two? When's it coming? But then there might be a little bit more pressure as well to get an R1S or an R1T because you have no clue what's coming. Now that we know what's coming and we have a broad sense of what it's going to be as a product and the price and range kind of, uh, there is some of that Osborne effect happening. But I don't think 
to your point, I don't think it's that severe. No, uh, like people waiting for the refresh of the next gen whatever for Tesla doesn't change the fact that somebody needs a Model 3 maybe today. No. I mean, I my somebody- referrals in the last uh, couple months prove otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> so many people kept on getting Model Y even though there's all this talk of, oh, is Model Y going to get refreshed soon? People don't care, man. We people care don't because care. we're we, uh, we cover it and we're in the know about it, but most people, including myself, realistic, if I wasn't doing this podcast, I would not have waited. I would not have cared for mm-hmm. an update at Model Y. I bought mine last year when it was the most convenient and applicable for me. It's like that whole upgrade your iPhone thing when when you need to, not when there's a better one, but when you're ready to upgrade because you need to upgrade. It's the same thing, but on a lot more money involved, so people take it a little bit more seriously. I don't I know somebody personally in my life uh, this week who bought a Model 3 knowing full well that something quote unquote better is in the in the works here. And that created no Osmore effect about pricing even because the, the twist of it is he bought it used. He bought a used Model 3 and he's like, this is exactly what I wanted, exactly what I needed. And this mm-hmm. is... More car than I've ever had in my life, and more car than I'll ever probably need for the next five, ten years. Easy. I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, they don't. No, most people don't care about. Ooh, wait for the refresh. If they ask us, hey, Mike, what do you think? Sure, maybe it's in our best interest to advise them. I might want to wait. There's a rumor there, but if like, well, <laughs> I just lost my last <laughs> my. <laughs> My brake cable just went out. The last one. That's not. We're not stopping anymore. Well, then you gotta work with what you got. These are the cards you dealt. Get this car, you know. But if somebody at were to ask us, maybe we give them a little bit more guidance. But then we also know that person well enough to vet them. Be like, hey, well, what's your budget? What are you looking at spending? Would you, you know, there, there's there's more vari- variables than wait buy the new next thing because. The new next thing is always going to be updated by something else, even if it's just incremental updates of... I mean, your Model Y is different from my Model Y, even though it's the same Model Y. It's not, you know? Like, there's... Drew's Model 3 is different than my Model 3. He's got an LFP. Like, just things change. They're going to always change. There's mm-hmm. no point of, like, waiting. So I, my, my point about the Osborne effect is that people who want the size that's already out there, you're going to get it. If I want that R1T bad enough, I'm getting it. Used or not, most likely used, but I'm going to get it. That No me waiting on nothing is going to change anything of that. And the people who want a smaller crossover, like an R2 or an R3, you're going to wait. Or Tesla's going to come out with something or somebody else is going to come out with something. You'll be like, ooh, I want that. None of us were thinking back in 2020... Or early, early, like really early 2021, but I say 2020, oh man, I'm going to get a Rivian, or I'm going to get an Aptera, or I'm going to get a... Nobody's thinking that. Like, we were like, Tesla, I want Tesla. And so, you set your mind to it, you got a Tesla, even if there were cheaper options out there. That I don't think the Osborne thing really counts the same way. So... All right, seriously, let's not make this let's not make this a Rivian podcast. What what else have we got going on? Sure. <laughs> I guess one last thing I also thought, even with the announcement of R2, okay. it's a hundred dollar deposit. I don't know if it's fully refundable or not. I think it is. But if, even if it is or isn't, you're giving a hundred dollars to Rivian. You add that up or multiply that by how many people have reserved, I think last we knew is around like sixty two, I think. No, forty two 60. or sixty two. Anyway, something, but sure. Anyways, that's 62,000 people times $100. That's a lot of money for Rivian to use on their current infrastructure to prep it for R2 production. Though, it, to be fair, yeah, like it's probably not enough, and they, of course, can't uh, lean on that forever. It is still cash that they can use. So, I have half a mind to put a reservation... Just to help them out. <laughs> yeah. Even if I'm it's not get my money back later. Well, just think about Cybertruck, right? You same. and I both exactly put in $100. There's so many of the people like us that did the same. 
and you actually got out of it. I still have one left on the order. I still haven't gotten my hundred dollars back because I haven't uh, relinquished that last one yet. For some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna go for an order on it, especially in the launch edition that it is right now, unless it's free or something like that. If I win in a raffle or something like that, but yeah, uh, I guess to yeah. End it on Rivian. I think there's more than meets the eye in the wonderful world words of Optimus Prime. But uh, I think we still have, in disguise. We still have time with Rivian yeah. in our existence. And I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. If everybody buys merch, I mean... <laughs> They'll help. Grassroots movement. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> if it's like a 25 to $50 t-shirt and everyone's buying one that's a lot of money though i guess not everyone but even still a sizable yeah. amount it doesn't need yeah. to be everyone uh i guess here's something that i did recently i went on a road trip and on it i pretty much went to uh reno and back for some business and i guess pleasure either or anyways went for a road trip to reno and got to uh, use FSD 11 at the time, which, of course, was very finicky. I forget the specific build of FSD beta 11 that I had. It was a bit finicky. The road trip was fine. Uh, had a good time driving it. The, the car did great. I decided to do a 10-minute per supercharger stop rather than what Tesla usually does is put you at one supercharger for... It kind of depends on the route. But at least the route that I take, they usually put me at one for about like 30 minutes and another one for 10 minutes. I decided to stop a little bit earlier for a 10 minute and another one for 10 minute and another one for 10 minute. I think probably another one after that, maybe. And I found that 10 minutes is too short of a time. <laughs> okay. Us trying to get out, uh, well, too short of a time, but well, maybe not too short of a time. It's, we, how I... What I mean by that is we would want to get out and stretch our legs and back because we're driving a long distance. I think in the round trip total, it was around 780 miles. Okay. Uh, and yeah, that was a bit much on my back. And it was, it was nice to have like the lumbar support and all that. But even still, driving for that long, I think it was a 12 to 13 hour round trip. Uh, I found was a bit taxing, and the stops were great, and I think having longer stops actually helped me at this point in my life. I believe I joked either in the tech podcast or earlier in this podcast, I'm only getting older, I'm getting close to my 30s, and I'm finding that I do need to stop a little bit more frequently, uh, maybe not more frequently, but a little bit longer, and maybe also more frequently to ease up on some of the road trip pains that you feel. and so. Taking a bit of time on the road trip is something that I'm starting to value a lot more. You, uh, you're you're not the same Mike who took the road trip last year. You're <laughs> well, that was older. a different vehicle. That's <laughs> with a a Ram fifteen hundred with I guess a a travel trailer on the back, so it kind of averages out in a way. But yeah. Uh, the reason why I bring that up as well is it was a great comparison with how FSD 11 was doing. Okay. Because the very next day, or even that evening, uh, when I got back, the car alerted me saying FSD 12 was available for me finally. So I got. I think I got that notification this week too. If you haven't downloaded it, I would highly recommend it, Randy. It has actually changed my outlook on FSD. <laughs> Oh no, I did Somehow. download it. I haven't driven my car since. Jeez. So I'll try to put some uh I'll try to put some videos here if I haven't deleted them on accident. But it has done some maneuvers that it used to not be able to do, such as being able to uh use an on ramp that was a little bit tricky. It was a very short time that you could merge on the on ramp onto the highway because it was a temporary lane or else you'd go back and go into the town or city that right. you're coming out of. And it's able to do that with a lot of confidence. 
Oh boy. Along with that, being in bumper to bumper traffic, I would be a little bit more uh, impatient or anxiety filled with how it would stop and go. It okay. sometimes would leave a little bit too much space and or it'd be a little bit too aggressive with going and stopping. But with FSD beta 12, it did also really good in bumper to bumper traffic to where it drove me all the way from one part of South Bay to another part of South Bay. Pretty much, let's just say, like, east to west on South Bay. Uh, with pretty much no interventions. The only intervention that happened was it was being a little bit... It was on... I have it on assertive or aggressive. Okay. And it was still being a little bit uh, tentative on merging lanes in some circumstances. But even so, even after that, it somehow uh, didn't display that behavior again afterward. I don't think I fixed it, but I think there's just that corner case that it was being put in multiple times that just didn't know what to do. Okay. But I guess what I'm getting at is I think FSD 12 is something that lives up a little bit to the hype that it's been getting what? On social media, surprisingly. What? I will be the judge of this next week. I okay. will report back. I, if you say it, Mike, because I know you, it has a little more merit to it, I will take a look. I will see, because God knows the last time I've activated it, like, willingly, like, sure, I'll go. Boom, boop. No, I'm like, ah, I just did it myself. Here's my dilemma I'm worried about. It's a very Colorado problem, apparently. Potholes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I trust FSD enough to just avoid potholes, which unfortunately there are a lot here because we put a lot of salt on the ground to break the ice down when it's snow time. It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. I hate <laughs> potholes. I have half the mind to start. I'm gonna run for mayor just, just to, uh, just to, like, fill these potholes quicker. That'd be my campaign promise. I Elect think we me joked and I'll about fill it in the last podcast, either in EV or tech, that uh, you were gonna run for president in 2028. Oh, that's but, right, because I'll be of age. Oh well, yeah, but maybe I'll start with, uh, yeah. I'll start with mayor. This is bit. your uh, <laughs> gateway. My Starting gateway as mayor in into Colorado. politics. Oh God! My opponents will just pull all these episodes of EV and tech, and they'll be like, "Case closed. <laughs> need I say more? Look at this guy. He's he's weird." I'm like, all the neurotic people are, and the, those who are weird enough to think they could change the world are the ones who do, or at least fix these potholes. <laughs> I. Anyway, so FSD, going back to the FSD thing, uh, FSD thing, I very regularly think about how much I just like regret buying FSD. Mm -hmm. it's like that was $6,000, not worth it. And if this is something that can sway my mind about it, I am all for it, Mike. So my question to you before I do it is, do you think it adds value up to or close to six grand? Yes. Oh my god. Surprisingly. It's something that I All pretty right. much You guys quoted. have a good week. Three, two, one. <laughs> I'll be right back. I'll let you know. <laughs> it is something that I mentioned to my wife after I think the second or third day of using it. Okay. Uh I mentioned to her that it got me home pretty much all the way. There's a few roads that are a little bit tricky that I I don't fault it for. There's a few turns and twists that even confused normal drivers. Some that I almost run into because they, they're not looking. Uh, and I'm also, well, I'm looking, but anyways. Um, it does a great job. I have to put it through a lot more paces. But so far, it's done bumper to bumper great. It's done regular highway driving great. It's done city streets pretty well. It doesn't do the weird lane changing thing nearby my work. Uh, that was jarring and then also uh there's this one in which i've what's nice is i've kind of kept a timeline of you can hit uh the dash cam button to record like the last two minutes behind and 30 seconds forward of content on your car and the tesla whenever you hit that button 
and there's certain turns that I've been documenting ever since I got FSD and I've been on this commute to work uh, on how FSD handles it. And I'm really excited because a lot of these are pretty much solved. Uh, like a week ago, it still was doing the same thing of, I don't want to make this uh, turn smoothly. It's pretty much like kind of like an off ramp. Like there's no stop or anything like that to the turn. It kind of just peels off. Uh, but it's not like a, a, a lane that is continuous. You're, you're pretty much changing lanes as you take this off ramp in a way, but it's in a city street. And typically, I, I guess not typically, on the ground, there's a bike lane and there's a solid line pretty much throughout the whole opening of that road. So it interprets as I don't want to go over the white line onto this road. I need to wait until it's dashed and that's pretty much almost too late for the turn. Now it's recognizing that it can go over white lines because the road is dictating the path. And it's not like the lines are dictating the path all the time. It also has to interpret the road and the path that it is carving for it to follow. Dude, I am so glad you're saying that because I have a very specific example where I'm just like, this is why FSD sucks and I'm never going to use it. I leave a shopping center like uh, a safe way it is a safe way and the way the to get to the side road intersection to, to then get on the main road instead of just leaving the parking lot and then making a left to get to the stoplight to then proceed to make another left you kind of have to do like this weird question mark sh maneuver to then get right there but it's legal it's purposeful and you are allowed to turn left but every time I have, I route my way home and it'll still do the blue line, it wants me to then make a right instead of a left because that's how the question mark starts to do the, the, the form of it, starts to curve like that. And then it just wants me to make a right go all the way down about half a mile or longer and then make some weird U turn at a stop sign that you can't make a U turn at to then go right back to instead of just turning left like you can do and you should do and it's and and it's dictating that because of the lines on the road i'm like dude any human a 16 year old permanent kid who just got his fresh permit would know to make this turn left instead of just following the line to and then go right you could just make this little curve it's just a wider curvier left turn to give you the room you need to be able to make a, another left turn at this light if you choose to make a left at the intersection. Mm -hmm. But the Tesla GPS, when I at least just route it, it just always has me do that thing. I'm like, oh my God, you're so stupid. Just no, 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 no. But I'm hearing you tell me that like it, it bypasses all that because it just sees the road. Like, oh, turn. Just to be fair, that is on my specific, there's a, this specific turn that I'm noticing that behavior happen. Contrary to that, when I was going to Best Buy this week, uh, it decided to follow some of the lines a bit too long and was pretty much ending up in a left turn only lane when it had to go straight. And that was like one annoying oh, part of it. But so it's not, what I'm trying to get at is FSD is probably that improvement that we're looking for. It's not like a god tier level of change that's made it into the best product ever but it has made it enough to where i've changed a bit of my tune on the improvement that uh version 12 adds to this entire lineage of fsd beta uh especially with just like that uh there's a turn that i go into my house and you have to cross a double yellow and there's no break but also, it's not like there's oncoming cars, but th they typically don't come because it's a, it's a suburban. Pretty much, it's okay to turn over this double yellow. They just, for some reason, didn't want to break the double yellow at that point. And before, with like V11 and prior, it would be very nervous with doing it. The wheel would, the steering wheel would rapidly uh, go end over end in both directions, trying to figure out, am I going left? Am I going right? Am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? What am I doing? But on V12, when I tried it, it was very smooth with knowing I need to go here. 
Mm -hmm. There is kind of a weird hump going on here, but I know that the road goes this way, so I'm just going to slightly turn and go, and then it just was on the road with little to no hesitation. So I think confidence is a good word to summarize FSD beta 12. That's important. Uh, At least for the build that I'm on right now. I know that earlier builds were having issues, and that's why they cut off access to a majority of people. I know people like uh, non-Rivian, but Rivian Mike, the guy that Drew hangs out with, with his, I believe, Model He needs a new era. name, because he doesn't count anymore. I think he's getting an R2 or whatever, so we can call him Does it count? Again. <laughs> Rivian but will be dead by then, or blah, 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 blah. We can call him Model 3 Mike. There we go. Because I don't own a Model 3. But uh, they tried, was it, the FSD 12 beta in one of Drew's videos, and it seemed like it was having some trouble. It was... It looked like it was exhibiting some V11 behavior at times. Oh, jeez. Right. With the new version of it that I've got, it seems a lot more confident. So I, I would still say, like, buyer beware. Not saying everyone needs to go buy of course, it today. We're still in beta forever, so always be buyer beware. But confidence is good. That's a, that's a word I'm looking forward to see if it's going to be a little bit more confident. I just tell you now that that's the exact word I'm going to take to test it to see if it fixes that problem. Because that will, that will fit. If it can maneuver that appropriately, accurately, mm-hmm. then I think it's going to fix over 85% of my issues with FSD. That's a good percentage. It will, you're right. It will make it worth six grand at that point. But I don't know, man. We'll, uh, I'm so hesitant. But uh, first, first things first, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to verify that I actually got v12 not some other 11.49 but like i gotta make sure it's actually v12 (laughs) and i will let you know so this podcast might be wrong in the sense that i'll report back next week if i don't have it but yeah we never know a week's a long time and we're technically recording a little bit earlier than usual a little peek behind the curtain we're doing this a little sooner so maybe a week and a half i'll let you know we'll see so exciting stuff on that front yeah. uh let's see what else was it I, I had something else that i wanted to bring up all right fine we can go back to rivian <laughs> <laughs> I'm, joking. I'm, joking. I'm joking i'm joking i'm joking all right we gave it 15 minutes let's talk about rivian again <laughs> I'm, I'm joking uh i don't know if you also saw somewhere in the news but apparently tesla is working on a extension cable I did actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's and I've got lukewarm feelings about it. Funnily enough, I was talking with someone, one of my friends who got a Model Three, and I was telling her about the whole Nax adoption, and then also like the port sure. location on a bunch of these vehicles, and she <laughs> she came up with why don't why don't they just make an extension cord. I thought, well, then you have to gra- you have to have an extension cord. You have to bring it around wherever you go because you're going to expect that you're going to have to use it. So you're carrying all this kind of like useless cable. And then also you don't know the state of like the charger and specifics, the stall, if it's a good port or bad port. And along with that, uh, what stalls are available where you're going and if you need it or not. It, it seems like a lot of hardware to bring around where an adapter and correct port placement is the way to go. And then this report comes out that Tesla is reportedly working on an extension cable. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm still conflicted on my feelings with the idea of carrying around an extension cable. Well, it could be bypassed. That's Tesla trying to help people fix the wrong choice about port placement. That's them saying, like, all right, you're not going to fix it. We'll do it for you. I, I commend them for even saying, like, Tesla could be like, not my car, not my problem. Ch- pay me what it's, whatever to use my, my, my station here. But, no, they're like, all right, listen. Clearly, your manufacturers don't care about your well-being as us Teslas do. So we're going to help you out. We're going to give you an extension cable to help you, to help you send the message to these companies. That their mm-hmm. port is wrong. Um, it's interesting, man, because I, here's my thought about that whole thing as a whole. It, it's it, it's wider than 
the extension cable. I have a feeling we're going to see a redesign of the charging stations again a little bit in a way uh, to accommodate the new mass flood of alternative EVs soon. Like, you know how, like, I've been to charging stations where instead of you backing up like this, it's it's now perpendicular to you in that sense. Mm-hmm. And you just pull through like it, it like like a gas station. I've pulled up to like a three to five charging and, and it's just my lane. And then there's there's another one to my right and then one to its right. And so it goes down a few. And that technically then fixed the problem because you could have pulled in on either side and just unplugged and picked your side. Mm-hmm. I would not be surprised if we saw some type of version of that. Something to help fix the mess. Because maybe we can get everybody to agree on Nax. And I felt pretty confident about that one. I'll be honest with you. I, I felt pretty, uh, you know, all in. I am not anywhere near as confident that people will move the port to the rear pass- or rear driver's side at all. I do not see that happening. I don't think... There's too many different vehicles to get them all on the same page like that. You might be able to convince them smaller port, more efficient, wider network. Yeah, on paper, that makes sense. But when it comes to engineering the thing and building it up, people like their internal team will give you reasons why, no, that space is better used for blah, 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 blah. Even if they're wrong, they're allowed to make that wrong decision. So I think, I feel, we'll see a more universal fit for these charging stations, at least for superchargers in the future. Because who who knows? Who's to say that the Cybertruck won't be towing something bigger and you can't just back it in unless you buy their extension cable. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But then you're blocking the road. You know, if it's how it's normally been, then you're blocking a driveway uh, uh, in a parking lot. It's still an issue. That's why I have a feeling that we'll see another redesign of of the stations at some point. Don't know when, don't know how, but that's what I feel. Sure. So the existence then of the extension cable, is it worth it or not? Is this going to just turn into another snake charger that gets swept under the rug with the uh, induction charging mat? Dang, you went there. <laughs> or is it going to come to light and actually be something that you'll see in the back of Rivian's F-150 Lightnings? If it comes to light, and I do think it will come to light, it's a Band-Aid. It's a placeholder. It's a stopgap until future iterations of, of, the, of the networks and vehicles kind of get a little bit more on page. I think there still serves a purpose to have an extension cable, period, mm-hmm. because vehicles can be towing things. And like I said, you can't just back them up or you can't just pull in. You're, you're going to be taking up space. You can't park. You can't cross lines like that because then you're hogging up charging ports. In the current configuration of what our charging stations look like now, it's just not practical. It's not most of the time it's not even probable you just can't do it but Mm -hmm. an extension cable fixes some of those issues and it's a good stop gap until the re-engineering of things happen even if that means they they move the charging stations uh like if you go to a mall or a shopping center and maybe in the far back out of the way eventually the like they already got the generator there and i was like all right well now we're just going to kind of you know, dig some of this part up. I could just see a rework kind of happening a little bit to make it more in line of like what gas stations do where you, it doesn't really matter. And then some gas stations have the long hose. So it doesn't matter what side you, you uh, fill up your tank that I don't see why that wouldn't be the case for EVs as well, because you, they're not all going to agree on the port. The easy fix is put it on the right side. Everybody put it on the right side. And by the right side, I mean on the left in the back, but they're not going to agree on that. I know they want to agree on that. So the next best thing, this extension cable will come to light. It'll serve a purpose. It'll also be a band-aid. It won't be a long-term solution, but it might, you know, good couple years, maybe even five years. Yeah, I could see that totally being a thing for a while and then eventually phase out. That makes more realistic than the, the snake coil or the inductive charging. Oh, man. What it could have been. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. I think the job's probably going to get taken up by the Tesla bot eventually. Yeah. But it yeah. would be nice to have a snake charger esque system that people could buy, even if it costs like, I don't know, $7,000 or $10,000. Do you want to buy FSD or do you want to buy a snake charger? 
Snake Chargers. <laughs> Agreed. I think that'd be oh, well. Maybe not in California. <laughs> <laughs> with the price that PG&E is uh, putting on a whole bunch of residents here, it makes no sense to charge at home unless you've got solar. Yeah. But, yeah. I, it'll be interesting to see if the uh, the extension cable does come around. But, yeah, I'm not too sure. I guess here's uh, a topic that I also want to bring up. Of course, because Rivian's on our minds because we love Rivian. And it's Rivian adjacent. Uh, do you think that the R3 and R2 have any competition from Subaru? Ooh. Ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, we don't pre-meditate these shows at, at any way, shape, or form. But I was actually having this thought before. I, I, I'll tell you my first, my initial reaction. No, 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 no. Cause Subaru's not even trying, but if they did try, Subaru they has just, one of the, they just signed a deal with Panasonic for some <sighs> cylindrical cells. So the thing is like Subaru is one of those companies that has that weird cult following as well, you know? And I see it in Colorado, dude. The stereotype is real. I literally see it everywhere. I'm like, oh my god! You could tell who's a native, who's an implant, who's a local, who's who's uh, you know, the, you see all of it. Who's military? Like, I see it all. And the stereotype about the Subarus in Colorado are 100 percent real. And they people love their Subarus. And to be fair, I once entertained a Subaru myself. I was like, that would have been cool. Something about Subaru felt right. But then the Model Y fixed so much of that, you know? But the Subaru, pre-Model Y, the Subaru was the right design. Because mm-hmm. uh, adjacent to that one would have been a Honda Civic hatchback, which I was very close at one point. So, dude, I was, like, at the dealership willing to sign paperwork close. And then I ended up not pulling the trigger, and I'm glad I didn't. Um, one of my best friends, childhood best friend, uh, he actually has a hatchback uh, Civic. I got to drive his, sit in his, and see it, and I realized how small it was. So much small that he ended up having to uh, trade his in for an upgrade once he became a, a father himself. I was like, I would have had this problem. So mm. then I was like, dang, should I have gone that Subaru? But then once we decided Model Y was the way, I was like, never mind. I'm good. Keep it. So. Against the Tesla, nah, Tesla's untouched. But your question was the R2, R3. It could. It could because what I feel like what we're challenging now is the battle of the fan base at this point because people who are loyal, diehard Subaru, but maybe they want an EV, but they don't want to give up their Subaru, would 100% jump on that. They would. And I bet they would make it even compelling. There would be a way to make it like, you know, they take, take the... I forget the 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 model of the Subaru, but it's a sports vehicle. R W S S R S W R X. All right, it's a three letter. There's the W R X, which is their sporty hatchback slash sedan. Depends yep. on what year you're talking about for the W R X. I'm talking about the W R X. I already know mm-hmm. that's what I'm talking about. That car. Imagine taking that design language and but but making it maybe more like an Outback ish, and, and you just make that. You do the Subaru thing to it. People will jump on that thing like hotcakes. Mm-hmm. But here's my why my, my gut reaction was like, no, they don't have competition. Um, Rivian has literally paved its own lane in the way with its own adventure network. There are things about Rivian that makes it kind of more appealing than Legacy Auto. And I think it's the legacy part. Hmm. And I'm a guy who has put his money where his mouth is. And I'm betting on on the re-innovated space of new companies, not the old. Clearly. I kind of want to bet on the old. You know, we've talked about Volvo. I would, I, I would not have said no to maybe a Ford Lightning at one point. I wouldn't say no to a Subaru even. But I, there's something about Legacy Auto. I'm just like, your time has come and pass. Make way for the, the Apteras, the Rivians, the Canoes, the Teslas, the... 
Lucids if they were a real company. You know, all that. Make Ray for all of them. So that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. I think about when I pose this question, I think about my own mother who is a Subaru <laughs> diehard fan. Uh, has, my mother-in-law has the Forester. Uh, Mike yeah. has posted photos. I don't know if you're going to put them up, but uh, maybe she or has, maybe not. She has a 2023 Forester. <laughs> yeah. So both of them have definitely drank the Kool Aid on it. I mean, to be fair, they could say the same with us and Tesla. Yeah. And uh, this the sort of cult following in a way of all these brands, and it's it's tough to yank people out of that mindset into a new one. It's tough to shake them by the collar and say why not look at this go try that it's a whole lot better right when they're perfectly content with what they got and that's something that my mom is slowly shaking out of she's realized i'm kind of done with subaru at this point i've gone through them like water i haven't been uh done good by subaru for a while now they keep on (sighs) failing on me so it only makes sense for me to for my next vehicle for it to be electric and she, all, she and I both thought it was going to be a Tesla, but once the R2 and R3 came out, I thought, immediately when I saw the R3, I thought of my mom. Right. Because she's yeah. all about that hatchback or sporty, off-road looking thing, even though it, it maybe will never touch the dirt. <laughs> it will always be You don't want it to, you just want it to have the capability to touch the dirt. Right. And with her, she always thought about safety and fun. And uh, with Subaru, at least when I was growing up, they they did have some threads of safety. I think Volvo was still pretty much the king there. But uh, yeah. when she had me, we she grew or she raised Mike me. and I basically had the same childhood growing up, and which is why we're the same, and we have the same <laughs> style of of what we look for in companionship with our wives. Like that's what it is. It was our upbringing. That <laughs> to the point that even the the Subaru, the, I didn't even know the Subaru was the thing until you said it right now. I was like, oh geez, there's no escape in this. <laughs> no, but yeah. So I was raised in a legacy, and then pretty much for the rest <laughs> of my life, I spent in the back seat of a Outback. And then the front seat of an Outback. And then yeah. a cross trek for a little bit. So she's very much in that mindset of, I want like a crossover thing. Cross trek does look nice. I do like it. Like, the cross trek, like both- she loves. Uh, she had the Outback for a while. The most recent ones have too much technology in it to make it a lot more finicky to use. Of course, as uh, our ginger friend co-host would say, software defines the experience. Or I don't know if he says that exactly, but he very much pushes that software is the leading, uh, I guess, emotion that you have, or I guess the the feelings that you have with the product. If it is a smart device, the software is going to determine whether your love is amplified and or pushed more into the distasteful uh, region. True, true. And so with the Outback, that's what happened with my mom recently. And she's like, eh, I'll go for the cross track again. She did the cross track, I think, once or twice. She's on it for, I think, the second or third time now. And I think the R3 is something that she was hoping to get into in terms of size. She wanted to go for like a Model 3. And so I think the R3 is pretty much on that level of compactness, but still raised a bit because, she, of course, she is getting up there in age. And I kept on saying you probably want the Y because of the uh, the height of the seat compared to the ground. Yeah. And yeah. so the R3 might be a little bit less than that with the Y or compared to the Y or compared to her current. Isn't it taller? Track. Oh, no, that's the R2. The R2 is the taller. The R2 is taller but shorter or narrower. It's pretty much what I think is it's the same pretty much dimensions because they're so close. They're off by inches. So okay, it's yeah. it's hard to say whether I, I'd have to get in an R2. And what really matters is right when height. you get inside it, too, because what it looks like on the outside doesn't equate to the cabin space on the inside. I I fell victim to that trick once or twice with Le- Legacy Auto. I was like, oh, look how this is going to be cozy. I got it. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> I'm trying to shift my stick. And I'm like, oh, no. It's, no. It and you're also not a big guy either. So it's yes! even funnier when that happens. You look yep. at it in pictures and you think it's so spacious and you get inside and you think, how does anyone else fit into this thing? Yeah. So- Nissan 350Z was one of those vehicles where I was like, how does literally I'm struggling? 
<laughs> yeah. How does anybody above 5'6 fit in this? I'm struggling. <laughs> That's me when I get into the, I think I actually have it on all these photos, the Subaru BRZ. Uh, or Toyota's version of the BRZ because they collaborate on that platform. Uh, it's very Isn't that much what the Celica used to look like for Toyota? Uh, it looks like a Celica in the front. That really maybe. long. I forget what Toyota's version of it's called. It, it used to be under the Scion brand. Uh, oh, you're talking about the... the well. I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, yes. it's still the BRZ as well. but uh, Or... It's what the BRZ is for Toyota or Scion. Oh, Scion. Scion the, the scars that cut deep. I used to own a Scion TC manual transmission, right. 2005. Wow. Oh, no, 2000. Yeah, 2005. Huh. I miss that thing so much. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think why I posed that question as well is one, it's it's somewhat personal to me because my mother and uh, your family member as well are both Subaru fanatics. Yeah, and so for them to try out something new is really exciting for us because you actually get to see them in a whole different environment and enjoy, hopefully, enjoy that product. And it's also an EV, so it's that much more exciting to say my family member drives an EV as well. So my for- fear is that they too are legacy human, like oh. You're not part of this time anymore. You're not part of this timeline anymore. Some people, there's some family members that will never own an EV. And they're like, I'm going to die driving this gas car. I'm like, yep, I hear you. You're stubborn, but you're you're lost, but you're a product of your time. And then there's other people, like my mother-in-law, who seem to have always been a little bit more open-minded. She'll be like, man, next car's going to... My mom, my mom mom told me, she goes... My next car will be a Tesla for sure, but she still has this like it's it's an older Mercedes now, and uh it's it's running like a Mercedes, it's running fine. she has no qualms with it. The build quality is amazing, so she's like, I feel like I'm gonna be with this vehicle for a while, but if this thing dies before I do i'm my next car will be a Tesla. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. all right, mom, <laughs> we'll see, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I guess. My my hope, and also my worry, is that Subaru steps up and actually puts the right foot forward in the EV space rather than doing a a half effort collaboration with Toyota and comes to some product that is very underwhelming and people buy it. It's just only because their brand loyalty and most likely a dealer convince them to get it yeah where they're missing out on maybe something a lot more exciting and new and enjoyable like an r2 or r3 rivian is a direct to sell too isn't it you don't have to go through a dealership nope right there right that alone i anything to help anybody avoid ever having to deal with a dealership or deal with a dealership again Mm -hmm. i will be uh a, an advocate for which is why i also i i bet against legacy because i i i i'm gonna close here's my final thought and then we'll wrap it up here i had been around long enough to be uh around scammy you know scummy sharks of dealerships before the internet age before you could fact check and, and like, you know, I, I've noticed that dealerships as a whole have more or less kind of got their act together because the power of the online presence, social media, blah, 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 and all that stuff. Like it, it can really put a, a dealership out of business. And I've witnessed one go out of business for it. I was like, yes, die. But um, unfortunately, I've been around uh, long enough that I... um one of my very first experiences with a dealership, I got scammed and I, I mm-hmm. was sold a lemon and I paid a lot of money for that lemon. And, uh, that skill, that, that, that experience had taught me a new skill from that day forward. I've always been very, very, very aggressive and very good at negotiating when it comes to buying a car or when I'm talking about a pay raise or a salary. I've oh, I, I've harnessed a skill in aggression 
and without being assert like I should say assertive, maybe not aggressive. It used to be aggressive because the, I I had bad experiences that I think died after the 2010s. So anybody dealing with it now, I don't think they will ever have this encounter that I'm talking about. But I did have, I had scummy, you know, snakes in the grass trying to, and, and, and took advantage of me. And it taught me, it, it, it taught me a valuable lesson. And since then, from that day forward, I've gone to every dealership with my wife, with my brother, with a friend, a lot of, even for myself. And I go in fighting, like metaphorically fighting. I, I, I do the Start song and dance. Punches. <laughs> I, I do the song and dance about negotiating and bringing prices down and da 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 da. And I know every trick because I've owned a lot of cars and, um, and I've been scammed a few times. Well, one specific one, there was a second one where it, I, I walked away so I could, I, there was a scam happening and I detected, I picked up on it, I detected it and I walked away. But, um, even though it helped me in other ways, like I E, like I said, it helped me when it came to like negotiating salaries. Um, I'm very, I'm very good at being confrontational without being intimidated or intimidating to the other person where both people can walk away happy. Um, so I'm grateful for that experience, but I don't wish anybody to get scammed. However, just because it is less likely to happen, the business model still exists that the dealership is there to make the most amount of money off of you and you are there to spend the least amount of money. And this direct to sell when you're buying new cuts all that out and people are like oh, you're already paying the premium for an ev you paid so much on your model 3 yes to a degree i haven't paid a freaking penny but for new tires once over the last five years i have saved money the longer i've had this vehicle and i'm trying not even to compare the gas to charging because it's not a fair comparison because if it is then i've long since recouped any premium just on the gas part alone equivalent when i would charge because those things would go up to 30 no more than 40 dollars a charge cycle where i'd be paying 40 to 60 at the pump for the same thing so that 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 i'm, I'm trying to exclude that just just with maintenance and upkeep and everything that has to do with that i've long since recouped my my money for this quote unquote premium and the car paid for itself in that sense but anything that can offer just a direct to sell so you can cut the crap with dealerships and I'm more jaded because I had bad experiences. And I've also had great experiences. I, I talked down uh, an asking price of 17000 uh, $17, and I got it down to, uh, to eleven five for a brand new car. And I had all these techniques. And that's, that's a whole other thing I'll say for another day. But like just, I had a way of like, hey, you need to move inventory, and I'm a paying customer. If you don't sell it to me, that... All this time wasted. We spent hours here, you know. Uh, all this time wasted. You're, you're not going to get a sell. And tomorrow, I'm just going to go to next door to the next dealership, and then mm. the next one. Like, I'm not loyal to this car. I don't. I don't care. I just need a car. So you know, it's you or somebody else. It's, that's a, that's on you. You know, I always put the ball back on them. And I just, as much as I like the song and song and dance, I like to stay sharp with my negotiating techniques because of work and pay raises and stuff like that. I personally like it. I know that's not for a lot of people. A lot of people are not confrontational and they don't know what they don't know. And a lot of people will be timid, not intimidating, but timid. They will get intimidated. They will buckle. They will feel pressure. And if they don't have people in their corner, people get bad deals. All that goes away if you just had a direct to sell for buying uh, a car. So any way shape or form that you can get a brand new car or even a used one without having to do that song and dance i encourage it because there's other ways if you want to get the charismatic skill set of negotiating there's other ways to do it where you don't get scammed so that's my telltale that's my cautionary tale and also why i say screw legacy <laughs> yeah i do to summarize in my own words i think a a revol maybe not a revolution but an evolution from the dealership model is necessary at this point. I think dealerships can still exist, but for Legacy Auto directly, I think that tie needs to be massaged a bit more in a different direction. Yeah. yeah. So, I guess 
Some questions that uh, I'll pose to you, audience, from our discussion today, and if you have any inputs. Uh, have you tried FSD 12? Have you seen many videos? Are you impressed? Are you not? And I guess, are we talking too much about Rivian? Not enough about no. Rivian? I don't want to hear that one. I don't care what the audience says about that. <laughs> Do you think Rivian's in trouble still? It seems like we keep on bringing it up in all the podcasts, but I guess more of, would you consider buying, if you don't have an EV today, would you consider buying a Rivian R2 or R3 or a potentially future uh, Subaru or, I guess, Jeep vehicle as well? that has comparable range and or capability. Yeah. Or just the good old Tesla, tried and true, do you know what I mean? Like Tesla, I got nothing bad to say about Tesla, period. FSD different, but like a Tesla vehicle is, that's bay, that's cream of the crop. That's, the, that's top dog for a reason. I, I might be a stand and a new fanboy for Rivian, but I know where, where my heart lies. Like I, I, I know who takes care of me once I hit end of recording I, I know what's done so definitely the semi semi is definitely a <laughs> well hopefully next week we get our fearless leader gingered leader back but if not it will be our secondary uh fearless leader uh jared leto uh jesus looking uh <laughs> co-host and and then i'll something i don't know i'm trying to keep comp- continuity mike i said it on the tech i'm saying it here Maybe I'll punish you for that. Maybe next episode, uh, <laughs> there'll be something coming. All right. Well, until then, you guys have a great week. We will see you next time with some more EV news. Take care. Bye. Bye.